Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Economists on the Economy, featuring Loretta Mester, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. We will begin the featured presentation in just a moment, but I wanted to inform everyone that we will be using Zoom's question and answer feature to take questions for this event. It is typically located on the bottom bar of the Zoom window. Please feel free to locate this now. You may submit questions at any time, both while our speakers are presenting and during the question and answer period itself. Once again, Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Nan J. Morrison, President and CEO of the Council for Economic Education, for her opening remarks. Thanks so much, Thomas. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for carving out time in your day to join us for what I expect will be a welcome conversation with our great friends of CEE, Loretta Mester, the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Thankfully, despite the COVID-19 crisis, CE is still here and still delivering on a mission that matters, bringing economic survival skills to students, their families, and communities. But the hard truth, a soft landing from this crisis will not be achieved for small Black and minority-owned businesses, nor for Black communities hard hit by both the virus, and, by the virus, excuse me, on both the health and jobs fronts. Uh, Chairman Powell talked about that uh, in his remarks yesterday as well. Economic responses to the pandemic have largely failed to reach minority businesses due to lack of banking relationships in addition to language barriers. 12% of minority owned businesses applied for the payroll protection program loans known as the PPP loans as compared to 75% of small businesses overall and it looks as though far fewer than the norm secured these loans in full. As the most vulnerable lose whatever gains they had made, and as they lose hope, there is a premium placed on effective action now. Lifelines for today that have the potential to build for tomorrow. CEE is acting now. Our purview in creating equity and justice may not be large, but we hope it's significant. We have and continue to listen. Our existing resources, such as the economics of racial discrimination, where students analyze the costs of segregation, have been added to substantially with new lessons, including one on payday loans. We're also presenting a series of innovative webinars that focus on culturally responsive teaching, where we look at building relationship capital for educators and developing a meaningful dialogue around embedded inequities. This is a must if you're an educator, and as a non-educator, I learned a lot from watching both of these webinars. In response to the pandemic earlier this year, understanding the immediate need for online learning, we added webinars on how to get there. One of the teachers wrote to us, thank you for this amazing resource during a turbulent time. To be a resource in a turbulent time, an institution must be in it for the long haul. We are. The public wants to see an expanded sense of community from all of us right now. They want those of us in our field to share our capacities and yes, our compassion. To this, we at CEE say yes. And speaking of capacity and compassion, it's now time to introduce our speaker, Loretta Mester. The Federal Reserve has many steady hands and minds at the wheel, and Loretta has certainly been among them throughout this crisis. The American people need perspective and context that leaders such as Loretta provide. According to former Fed Vice Chairman Donald Cohn, Loretta expresses herself clearly and isn't afraid to make her views known. I know that is She's a board member and she lets me know <laughs> in a good way, even when they go against received wisdom. She's open to data and studies that might change her mind, exactly what we all need. This year, she was also a judge for the first time for our first ever virtual national economics challenge and she did a great job for us. It's a pleasure to turn this event over to her. So let me start by thanking Nan and the Council for Economic Education for the opportunity to speak today. I have the pleasure of serving on the Council's uh, board, so I've actually seen firsthand the important work the Council is doing to increase economic and financial literacy in the country. And I want to just point out that the Council's mission statement explains it really well. Equipping, equipping students with the knowledge of financial literacy and economics can help them make better decisions for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. And I do think it's noteworthy that despite the burdens of the pandemic, the council has found very creative ways to carry on its mission, including its support of teachers, as Nan discussed, 
the National Economics Challenge, which I had the pleasure of being a part of this year, and the speaker series. So I, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and today, before we open it up for questions, I'm planning to give you an update on the economy and on the Federal Reserve's policy response. And as always, the views I'll present are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or of my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. So as we know, the coronavirus pandemic is a global public health crisis that's inflicted pain and hardship on people all over the world. It's an unprecedented situation and unprecedented actions have been taken in response. The country took aggressive social distancing measures to limit the spread of the virus, um, and that resulted in a shutdown of much of the economy starting in March. Now, this was an investment in public health that bought some time for the healthcare system to increase its capacity to care for the sick, for doctors and scientists to learn more about the disease itself, and for the country to begin to develop tests and treatments. But at the same time, the effect of the shutdown on the economy was swift and severe. So let me share a, a couple of pictures with you that will illustrate that. So in the first quarter, real output declined at a 5% annual rate, with real consumption down almost 7%, and non-residential business fixed investment down nearly 8%. And these declines reflect what occurred in a, in a single month, March. So earlier this month, the National Bureau of Economic Research's uh, Business Cycle Dating Committee determined that economic activity peaked in February and that the US economy entered a recession. I anticipate that the second quarter is going to show the most severe effects of the pandemic shutdown on economic activity. Most of the private sector forecasts for second quarter GDP growth range from minus 25 down to minus 40% uh, measured at an annual rate. So I couldn't even show that on this chart if I wanted to, I have to change the scale. And I agree that the second quarter growth could be the largest quarterly decline on record. Now, the decline in activity led to both headline and core inflation readings moving down in March and April. And I expect inflation to decline further this year because the sharp pullback in demand will outweigh any upward pressure coming from limited supplies of certain goods and services. Now, in recent weeks, states have begun to relax some of their stay-at-home restrictions, and we're beginning to see some positive signs in the data. Retail sales rebounded significantly in May with sales up across all major categories. And in the fourth district, um, the fourth district of the Federal Reserve includes Ohio, parts of Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Um, we're seeing that some activities picking up faster than our business contacts had expected them to. Tourism activity increased after Memorial Day and foot traffic at retail stores in the region moved up. Now, even so, about 40% of our contacts don't expect activity to recover to pre-pandemic levels for at least a year. Now, as more regions and sectors of the economy reopen, rates of growth are going to look very good. But we're digging out from a very deep hole, and I think it's more informative to think in terms of levels. One of the most positive pieces of news we received is the employment report for May. Instead of rising, as most economists had expected, the unemployment rate fell. And instead of losing jobs, payrolls increased by 2.5 million jobs. This is great news. Um, it points to some stabilization in the labor market after two months of deep declines. And I'm hoping we're going to see uh, and continue to see positive reports over coming months as more of the economy opens up. But it's also important to put May's report into perspective. So in April, the unemployment rate surged to 14.7%. And in May, it did fall. It fell to 13.3%, but that's still considerably above its previous peak in October 2009 in the aftermath of the Great Recession. And it's still well above the 3.5% uh, it was as recently as February. In May, 21 million workers were unemployed compared to 6 million in February. So that's about one in 12 Americans age 16 or older. 
that's worse than in October 2009 when it was one in 15 people who were unemployed. Now, the gain of two and a half million jobs in May was a record monthly gain, but it's only about 11% of the job losses we saw in March and April. And in fact, if you look at the level of, un of, of employment, of payroll employment, right, it's near the lows we saw right after the Great Recession. So what that means is that the economy has lost almost all the jobs it added over the entire expansion of 10 plus years. Another way to look at that is employment is still 13% below February's level. Now, these are pretty stark uh, pictures here, um, but the deterioration in the labor market is even sharper than the numbers indicate. Remember that many people left the workforce at the beginning of the shutdown, and they don't show up in the unemployment rate. And many other workers had their hours cut. Our survey of firms in the fourth district indicates that while layoffs began to slow in May, firms have recalled workers more slowly than they originally intended to. And moreover, the improvements in May were not evenly shared. Indeed, half of the net private job losses since February have been in the leisure and hospitality and the retail trade sectors. And those are the two sectors ranks ranked lowest in terms of average hourly earnings. The unemployment rates among Blacks and Hispanics have been chronically above those of whites and Asians. But over the long expansion, we had finally seen some progress being made on that front as the gap in unemployment rates narrowed. But now the pandemic has increased the disparities all groups have experienced an increase in their unemployment rate since February, but the increase was less for whites than it was for the other groups. And in May, the unemployment rate for both Blacks and Asians continued to edge up rather than fall. So it's per particularly distressing that much of the sacrifice over the pandemic period is being borne by the most vulnerable in our economy, lower income and minority workers and communities, as Nan has pointed out, and the smaller of the small businesses. And I think it shines a bright, bright light on a longstanding economic inequality that needs to be addressed if the economy is to perform up, up to its potential. So like the Council for Economic Education uh, does, I know, um, I believe that education is a path to better economic outcomes for individuals, households, and the country at large. Our workforce has become more educated over time, but if you look at this chart, what you'll see is graduation rates for whites, Hispanics, and Asians have risen over time, but graduation rates for those of Blacks remain well below those of the other groups, and they've shown no progress over time. Now, economic well being rises with education, so if more is not done to ensure that Blacks who enter college have the support to complete their degrees, and here I'm talking about financial support, but also mentoring and other support that's really needed to get through college, economic inequality is likely to continue to rise. So hopefully, Nan, your group uh, can help uh, rectify some of that inequality. So now let me turn to the outlook and policy. Economic forecasting is particularly challenging at this time. With states relaxing stay at home restrictions, I expect economic activity to pick up in the second half of the year, but there's considerable uncertainty about what that recovery will look like after the economy reopens. The shape of the recovery is going to depend on the path of the virus and our ability to handle its spread through testing, contact tracing, treatment, and risk-focused restrictions on activity. And it's also going to depend on the behavior of households and businesses and how comfortable they feel in re-engaging in economic activity. So at the Cleveland Fed, we've been doing a daily national survey of households. Um, and what that survey suggests is that there are widely varying views about the pandemic and how people plan to behave. In the most recent results, about 60% of the respondents think the pandemic will last a year or less. 
And on average, this group says they're likely to return to their pre-pandemic usage of bars and restaurants, public spaces, public transportation, and crowded events. Now, the other 40% of the respondents expect the pandemic to last more than a year. And on average, this group says they will not engage in these activities to the same extent they once did, even after the pandemic has ended. So I think it's gonna be important to, to continue to monitor household and business attitudes when assessing the economic outlook. Now, the other important factor that's gonna determine the path of the recovery is how successful policy actions are and ensuring that the temporary disruption and activity we've seen so far doesn't cause lasting damage to the economy and that the recovery has enough support to be sustained. So let me discuss some of the policy actions and then talk about the outlook. So both the federal government and the Federal Reserve took significant actions quickly to provide households and businesses with relief during the shutdown. Fiscal policymakers made grants to individuals, to certain businesses hit hardest by the pandemic and to states and municipalities. They've expanded unemployment benefits and they've uh, funded the Paycheck Protection Program, which Nan mentioned, uh, which provides small, business, small businesses with loans that turn into grants if they maintain their payrolls. Now, as the magnitude of the need has come into better focus, the federal government has increased its level of support. Although the amount of support has been sizable, so is the depth of the economic downturn. In my view, further direct fiscal support is going to be needed for states and municipal governments and for households most affected by the pandemic. The Federal Reserve is not legally able to make grants, but it has taken significant actions and is committed to using its full set of tools to support the economy guided by our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability. So early in the pandemic, the Fed began taking actions to help ensure that financial markets have enough liquidity to continue to function well. And this is important because well-functioning financial markets are what allow credit to flow to households and businesses and monetary policy to effectively transmit to broader financial conditions. So when conditions became strained, the Fed began buying treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities and conducted operations in the repo market to ease those strains. And on our meeting last week, the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, said that over the coming months, the Fed would increase its holding of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, at least at the current pace. The Fed's also set up emergency lending facilities with the backing of the U.S. Treasury to serve as a backstop to other key credit markets, including money market mutual funds and the commercial paper market. And the Fed is also ensuring that our central bank counterparties abroad have access to dollar funding. So although volatility and risk spreads have not returned to pre-pandemic levels, there has been a significant lessening of stress and an improvement in market functioning in many markets since these actions have been taken. Another set of our emergency lending facilities focuses more directly on supporting the flow of credit to households, to businesses of all sizes, and to state and local governments. So included in this group are the municipal liquidity facility, which purchases short-term notes from states to help them manage cash flow pressures, and the Main Street Lending Program, which supports lending to small and medium-sized businesses that were in sound financial condition before the onset of the pandemic. Now, based on consultations with both lenders and with potential borrowers, the Fed has adjusted the terms on some of these programs to ensure that they'll support the economy as effectively as they can while safeguarding taxpayer funds. And earlier this week, the Fed announced it was seeking public feedback on a proposed expansion of the Main Street program to nonprofits, which of course provide vital services in the economy. Now, because much of the flow of credit to households and businesses relies on the banking system, the Fed has encouraged banks to use its discount window as a source of liquidity and to work with their borrowers affected by the virus. And the Fed has temporarily relaxed some of the regulatory requirements and oversight, supervisory oversight, so the banks have greater capacity to lend. And last but not least, in March, the FOMC reduced its target range for the Fed funds rate 
our policy rate to, to zero to a quarter percent. And at our meeting last week, we maintained the funds rate at that level and reiterated that we expect to maintain this target range until we're confident the economy has weathered recent events and is on track to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Now, as more states relax restrictions on activity, the economy is moving from a shutdown phase through a reopening phase and into a recovery phase. And as that happens, the focus of Fed policy is going to change. It's going to expand from supporting market functioning and the flow of credit to supporting the recovery. So I expect to see, as I said, improvement in the second half of the year as the economy reopens. But after that, I believe it's going to take quite some time for economic activity and job levels to approach more normal levels. The improvement will likely vary across sectors because even if people can resume some of their normal activities, they need to feel some reassurance that it's safe to do so. And in some industries like travel and leisure and hospitality, it will likely take quite a while longer for activity to pick up than in others. By the end of this year, I expect that output will still be about 6% below its level at the end of last year. And the unemployment rate, while down from its peak, will still be around 9%. And I expect inflation to remain below our 2% goal for some time to come. So in my view, very accommodative monetary policy will be needed to support the recovery and the return to the FOMC's goals of price stability and maximum employment over time. And my economic forecast is actually very similar to the median forecast of the FOMC participants that were released last week, which show an economic recovery starting in the second half of the year and continuing over the next couple of years. Almost all of my FOMC colleagues agree with me that it'll be appropriate for the funds rate to remain at its current level through 2022, the end of our projection horizon in support of the recovery. Now over the next several weeks as more states reopen, we will get further readings on the condition of the economy. The uncertainty around the, the outlook is extremely high because we're in an unprecedented situation. Outcomes depend not only on appropriate economic policy, but also on public health considerations. The epidemiologists tell us to expect periodic upswings in the number of cases until a vaccine can be distributed. And we're actually seeing that today in some locations. Now, people often say that the virus determines the timeline. And I agree with that. But that doesn't mean we're helpless to affect the outcomes. Increased investment would speed up the progress on testing, contact tracing, and treatments, and help ensure that the healthcare system has adequate capacity. Better, better adherence to the guidelines on social distancing, mask wearing, and hygiene would help to control the virus's spread. And these actions combined would make it safer for people to re-engage in activity and would allow for interventions to become more focused on helping those at highest risk from the disease, thereby supporting the recovery. May's positive employment and retail sales reports remind us of the resiliency of the US economy, and that's something we should remember. Of course, if the number of cases of the virus is not well controlled and the healthcare system gets overwhelmed, then the economic outcomes I've discussed could turn out to be much more dire with people and businesses restricting their own activity, even if states do not reinstate restrictions. So at this juncture, I think it makes a lot of sense for monetary policymakers to continue to monitor the economy as the country begins to re-engage in economic activity, to continue to support the flow of credit to households and businesses and ensure that financial markets continue to function smoothly. To remember there are several different scenarios that could play out and to stand ready to use all our tools to mitigate lasting damage and to support the economy's recovery back to maximum employment and price stability. So that concludes my prepared remarks and I'm looking forward to, to taking questions and hopefully providing some answers.
Hello, everyone. Just as a quick reminder, we will be using uh, Zoom's question and answer feature to take questions rather than Zoom chat or hand raising. This is typically located at the bottom of the Zoom window, so please submit your questions there if you'd like them to be answered by President Nestor. Thanks, Thomas. Actually, I'm going to sneak in myself with the first question. Um, you talked a lot about economic inequality uh, and like everything else today, it seems like there are so many factors that the Fed doesn't control. You talked about jobs, you talked about job creation, you talked about um, education. What, uh, what are the areas where you think the Fed can have a little bit more influence on this particular issue? Yeah, so the Fed has been focused on this for quite some time. Although everyone thinks about the Fed as being monetary policy, we actually have a group of really good economists and others who focus in on community development. Um, and we partner with a lot of organizations in our districts. Um, it's great that we have this sort of district network across the country of Federal Reserve Banks um, and with the Board of Governors in DC. Um, and we put on programs and study these effects. Um, we do a lot of work on workforce development issues. We partner with community colleges um, to, to look at um, things like um, internship programs. The Cleveland Fed has research that's been used um, for policy making um, in terms of uh, what we call opportunity occupations, which are occupations that pay higher than the median wage but don't necessarily require you to have a bachelor's degree. So there's an ongoing effort there to really um, educate um, and also influence those policymakers who can um, set policy in that area. And I think we can all step up and do more. We have to understand that if we don't focus on these issues, we're not going to have as robust an economy. So it's in everyone's interest, really, to solve these longstanding problems. And I, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that I get to work with you, Nan, because your organization is doing a lot to educate us all about some of these disparities and what we can do about it. And, I, and I, I know that we're in talking now about um, the personal financial challenge that we may bring to Cleveland. So I, I think, you know, we all have to work together on this. Um, we have to stand against um, inequality that these longstanding inequality. And I, I do, I, I'm hopeful in the sense that there's a lot of people now focused on this and I'm very hopeful that we can actually make progress, more progress than we have in the past. Thanks, Loretta. Um, I, I appreciate your kind remarks and we are uh, fortunate to have you helping us to move the ball forward for sure. Um, question is, is coming in that asks, is really asking about the balance between fiscal and monetary policy and could fiscal policy really be more helpful now? Well, as I said, um, I personally, and this is my personal view, is that the states and municipalities and the people most affected by the pandemic, you know, the ones who are going to be, a lot of people are going to come back to work, right, because we are seeing this open up, but there's going to be a, still a large number of people who are going to struggle to get reemployed, right? We see this when we have these kinds of big declines. We've never seen anything this big, but I think there's going to be more need for fiscal policy. Um, the Fed is going to use its tools as, you know, all, all our tools to support the recovery, but we're not a grant making institution. And I think that at the end of the day, the municipalities and states are gonna need more support as will people um, who have been hurt by the pandemic and don't, do not currently have jobs and will find it hard to get reemployed. Um, our, our, our board chair, Barry Hames, put a, a kind of a finer point on this, which is what do you think is gonna happen in July when some of these programs run out or do you think they'll be extended? Well, I'm not, programs. yeah, I mean, it's my hope is that people will see that there's a real need. Um, and I, you know, that's my hope. You know, I think it's definitely going to be needed that we have to span this because, you know, over time, if you looked at sort of the policies that we've all done, including the fiscal side and the Federal Reserve, right, I think when we started, and I think this is true in general, probably people would not have guessed it would have lasted as long as it did, right? I mean, we started out thinking like, oh, we'll be away from work, you know, a couple of weeks. Well, this is going on much longer. And I think over time, what you've seen is, you know, the PPP program was extended and some of the criteria were changed. 
The Fed has done outreach on its programs and has changed term sheets as we've gone forward because we're really trying to make the programs address the issues as effectively as they can. So I know that sometimes people say, well, it's much more confusing. I think part of the confusion was they were rolled out quickly because it was very important to get aid and relief quick, but that the cost of that is sometimes it wasn't fine tuned to what, what was needed. So we're, I know at the Fed, we're continuing to look for gaps and places where we can use our tools um, um, and facilities. And that announcement about the nonprofits and the Main Street Lending Program is an example of that. So we're continuing to do um, what we, we can do and, and think creatively about things. Um, and I'm sure on the fiscal side, you know, as you know, they're just debating now about a, a potential new package of aid as well. I think, you know, we both, I think this is a case where both the fiscal authorities and the Fed really want to work so that we're doing what we can using the tools that we have at our disposal um, to give relief to the economy as it goes through this unprecedented uh, shock to the economy and to, to everyone. Thanks. That, that certainly, I think that really came through in um, Powell's testimony. I um, was listening to that over the last couple of days. Uh, question uh, from, from Graham Tanaka. Uh, the Fed's indicated that it expects to sh keep short-term rates near zero until 2022, which, you know, it has to be a record. <laughs> what specifically contributed to this really long forecast and what would have to change to move that outlook? Well, I mean, if you look at the projections for the economy, um, this is a hugely deep shock. Um, just think of those, some of those charts I showed in terms of employment, right? A lot of people out of work. Right, we just shut down the economy and it's gonna take some time to come back. I think that we really need to um, think about sort of what's the path forward and that's where the uncertainty is, is very large. But given how deep the shock is, how many people are out of work, our goal is to really make sure that the recovery is supported. And my personal view is it's going to take interest rates that low um, for quite a long time to support the recovery going forward. What would change that? Well, if things turn out to be better than expected, you know, if, if suppose we got a, a vaccine much quicker than we thought, right, and it could be distributed well, I think that would be a very big relief, right? People could go back to work. Um, sure, there's still going to be disruption because as we saw, right, some firms have already declared bankruptcy, but right, that would make a, a better outcome, so, and a better outlook, um, and that would be something. But right now, if you look at both private sector forecasters, the FOMC participant forecasters, and of course, in this kind of, you know, I know you had Mark Zandi on uh, as one of your talk, you know, one of your speakers, you know, he'll say the same thing. Like, it's very hard to write down a forecast at this time, because there's many, many different scenarios. So my own personal view is I do have to put in a forecast for the Fed when we give out those projections. But I'm always thinking in terms of scenarios because right now there's a lot of different scenarios. So if you think about one path of the, of the virus, you'll write down one kind of economic outlook. Another, you might write down another. I, I understand that need well. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, so you talked about the fact that there are all these different scenarios and all these, these kind of disconnects and what if one thing happens, what another thing what happens if another thing happens. Um, there seems to be also this disconnect between um, some of the economic indicators that you know, move around a lot, but the equity markets, while they have taken giant swings back, seem to be in, in decent shape, at least as of a few hours ago. So, so, but there does seem to be a big disconnect between what's happening in the markets today and what we hear about these other important things, including what potentially another surge in the fall. So I'm wondering if you could maybe stitch that together for us a bit. Yeah, well, as you pointed out, your comment about at least the last time I looked, you know, was healthy. It just tells you, right, there's a lot of volatility in the equity markets. What we're trying, what we do in the Fed is we're, we set monetary policy and we can affect broad financial conditions, right? And that's our goal, right? We don't necessarily look at the equity market and, and you know, think, oh, it's moved up, great, or oh, it moved down, right? What we're trying to do is we're affecting, right, broad financial conditions because that allows for the economy, right, to, to, to move and activity. And so we're supportive of activity. 
you know, why different traders in the markets may have one view one day and other traders might have another view another day and that creates the pricing, that's fine, right? But what we're trying to do is we're trying to set our policy looking farther out, right? And have a path for that monetary policy that can be supportive of the recovery once the economy reopens, right? And firms and consumers and households get back to uh, a regular, a more regular way of living, cadence of living. And I just think that's going to take a long time. I think it's, this is something that none of us have lived through before. I think we're all learning as we go in terms of, you know, how comfortable do we feel going out and re-engaging. Um, and uh, I just think that this is going to take some time. And, and at the Fed, we want to be there to support that recovery, make sure that it's a sustainable recovery. In, in one scenario, we could end up uh, with some, some bigger challenges than not. And I have a question from Gloria Schneider, who's one of our award-winning educators. Uh, she said, would the Fed ever consider going to negative nominal interest rates? And so, maybe what conditions? <laughs> yeah, so we have talked about all the tools of monetary policy as part of our framework review. So this is the review we've started oh gosh, like a year and a half ago, um, to actually look into uh, how we set monetary policy, our strategy, our communications of monetary policy, and the tools of policy. And so we've had several discussions that are out in the minutes of FOMC meetings, if people care to look, about tools. And, you know, there's a pretty strong, uh, you know, statement there that people on the FOMC do not think that negative interest rates are a policy tool we would want to use in the United States. We know it's used in other countries, um, but we don't, we're not, re, we're not sort of actively discussing that and we're not, and we've put out um, information that says it's not a tool um, that we're using. Chairman Powell has said that I think in his testimony and he's also answered questions about that. Um, and there's a variety of reasons. One is that we have other tools that we've used before and that we think are still effective um, in terms of our forward guidance about the path of interest rates and also our asset purchases um, that we used during the Great Recession. And secondly, the financial markets in the US are different than the financial markets in other countries. And so negative interest rates would have a lot of risk associated with them. And it's not clear at all from the studies that I've seen and that have been done uh, that it has as, uh, the benefits would outweigh the costs. So it, this is not something, and I, I right now from what I um, understand about the financial markets and, and that tool, it's not something I would support going to. Somebody was just asking about which of the tools would you say are the ones that you're looking toward as this is probably gonna be my next step and these are the ones I wouldn't like to use. So I su suspect that negative interest rates would go be on the probably not list. Are there any particular ones that you're looking toward toward now as the well, next step in your most favorite yeah. scenario? Yeah. So, you know, as the Fed has put out um, a couple of communications about our policy tools, and again, part of the framework, um, if you look at the, min the minutes of our FOMC meetings, you'll see that. Um, we've had good discussions, I think, uh, about forward guidance. And of course, that was something we used during the great financial crisis of, and, and the great recession to, to sort of add accommodation once interest rates hit zero. Um, and then our large scale asset purchases, the studies, you know, show that that actually had an impact of lowering uh, term premiums. So those are tools that we've used before. They're part of our toolkit. They're in our arsenal. Um, and those to me are the tools that I would see as being the ones that uh, we would go to. But you know, we're always you know, looking for ways to improve um, our tools. And so when we discuss these things, we always think about, all right, what did we learn over that, uh, the Great Recession when we used those tools? And if you remember, right, we started out with forward guidance that was qualitative, and then we had some uh, calendar base and we had state base. Um, and so there are different forms of those tools. You know, I, I'm a person who thinks that the communications that surround the use of those tools are, are key to their effectiveness. And, 
And I know that's part of uh, the belief of the Federal Reserve is that we need to just communicate very well what our intentions are. So that, that's one of the reasons I enjoy doing these things, Nan, is I, I do think it's important for us to explain the rationale for what we're doing and why we're doing it, because it actually makes monetary policy work better if people actually understand what we're doing. So to my mind, those are, those are high on the list of tools that we've used before. Um, we have a track record and the economic studies that we've done um, and that private sector, you know, academics have done suggest they actually did work. Uh, Tony Mace is joining us and he is asking about um, what you're thinking about forward guidance uh, as it's uh, altering forward guidance. Are you thinking about altering forward guidance to more tightly bind it to metrics such as unemployment? What do you think about yield curve control as a policy tool? So okay. look very specific on tools on that one. Yeah. So, so right now, I think uh, the public and market participants actually understand our intentions about the path of interest rates, right? I mean, we've said, we've communicated, right, that we intend to keep interest rates low, right, until the economy. And if you look at what interest rate, where interest rates are right now, right, they are very low. So that's a good thing. We've communicated. I think as the things play out and the recovery goes on, right, we do have these other tools in our toolkit and forward guidance is one of them. My own personal view is that you could do forward guidance qualitative, you know, state, what we call state-based, so tied to some of these economic outcomes, or even calendar year, and they all can be effective if you communicate well what you're intending to do with them and what happens, you know, as you get closer to our dual mandate goals. And I think, but, but I think like in most economic models, right, the, the forward guidance that's tied to economic outcomes, is kind of the go-to way of doing that. And we did use that um, during the Great Recession and the recovery from that. So, so I think, you know, that's a, as we talked about, you know, in both the Chicago Fed conference that's related to our framework where we talked about tools, right? I think that's still something that we have in our arsenal should we need to go to it as the recovery goes on. And my own personal view is we will need to have um, a very accommodative monetary policy. Same thing with what we call large scale asset purchases, right? We learned some things over time about that. If you remember, right, we first, when we first did it, we had a, a, a dollar amount. And then as time went on, right, we decided to do a more flow base. And so there was a lot of learning and that went on and those lessons we bring to this um, situation as well. In terms of yield curve control, I mean, that's something that's come up. I know um, Lil Brainer, Governor Brainerd has talked about it. I know that um, others on the Board of Governors have, have talked about it publicly, about what, what their stand is. My own personal view is, you know, whenever you think about a new tool, you have to think about how you design it to be effective and also how you, how you would you exit from it. So my mind is we need to think a little bit more about it before we say one way or the other. Um, I can imagine uh, using it if we needed to, to reinforce our forward guidance um, on the short end of the curve as a way of sort of really emphasizing that we want to keep that, you know, short-term interest rates low. But I haven't come to any hard and fast conclusion about yay or nay because I want, want to see more work on it. So you happened to mention um, your balance sheet. Uh, and as one of the, the tools that you had used. And this question comes from Chet Ragavan, who's a former chief risk officer, about how concerned uh, the Fed is uh, with potential ratings deterioration in the credit markets, given the growing balance sheet. Well, you know, as we said, this is a um, unprecedented situation. And there are going to be firms that don't do well through it. Um, the, the liquidity facilities are, and the, the ex emergency facilities, right, are intended to help firms that, through no fault of their own, right, were healthy before it. And so we have, but recognizing there is risk there because even if you were healthy before, right, you may not do. But this is such a big, big economic um, hit um, that I'm comfortable taking on some more risk than we might have 
earlier. I think we had to. I think this is the, the right direction. And I think those facilities, right, are really part of the toolkit of getting us through this pandemic shutdown period and supporting the economy as it gets through the reopening phase and into the recovery phase. So given that, what are the kinds of things that you're going to be looking the most at during the summer? And we actually had a question that said, what if the equity market becomes a bubble, um, given all of the changes and could that, that cause uh, economic conditions to be even more challenged? So uh, we all have all these questions and all this uncertainty. What are the things that you're going to be laser focused on over the next quarter? Right. So, you know, one of the great things about the Cleveland Fed and the other Federal Reserve Banks is that we can monitor things really down at the level of this individual businesses, um, labor market, people who are really engaged in the labor market in terms of helping uh, workers get back to work, um, labor market agencies. So that kind of information is crucial at times like this when there is something going on at a high level. So the you know, and you've seen also an expansion of these, what we're calling very uh, high frequency statistics. You know, I can see people are looking at um, open table metrics and all those kind of metrics. Those are very important, but also the contacts that we have in the districts are one of the things that really can give us information about, you know, how fast are things coming back? What are the barriers to coming back? Um, we ask routinely our firms, um, and we've been doing this extra reconnaissance all throughout uh, about, you know, how many employees are you bringing back? How many did you have to let go? What's your plans going forward? So that kind of information is really going to be crucial to really identifying how firms come back. And I, as I said in the prepared remarks, business and, fir and uh, consumer attitudes and household attitudes are going to be really key here, right? Because if you don't feel comfortable going out and about and re-engaging in economic activity, it doesn't matter if the state says you can go do it, right? You're not gonna do it. So those kind of things are things that we're gonna monitor going forward. And of course, you know, this, the health of the financial system in terms of uh, is money able to flow? So that market functioning, those actions we took very early on in the pandemic, I think were very crucial. Uh, to making sure that we have, can avoid a financial stability problem on top of a pandemic. And so we're going to be very focused on making sure that the markets continue to function. You know, I, my own personal view is, you know, the, again, we're focusing in on broad financial conditions and not on the equity market per se. Uh, but of course, you know, extra volatility in markets or excessive volatility in markets can be a detriment to economic activity because uncertainty is something that neither households nor firms uh, really like. And so it can deter activity if there's excessive volatility or excessive you know, uncertainty about the future. Marianne Johnson is asking um, if you, back again to some of the fiscal uh, policy issues related. Um, if the rising federal deficits uh, uh, portend some danger given that your, your balance sheet's also extending, so that kind of interplay, uh, what kind of um, effect do you think that might have? Right. So I think the fiscal uh, budget, right, we've had sort of unsustainably large fiscal deficits and budget problems for a while. Um, you can't have debt rising faster than the economy. Um, and at some point, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. Um, but right now isn't the time to deal with that. Right now, we're in a very serious um, economic downturn, um, unprecedented, and we should be using all fronts, right, to fight that and to buoy the economy and give relief to the people and to the small businesses and to the all, all to get through this. And yes, that's going to add to the deficits um, and we'll have to deal with that. But we can deal with that once the economy gets back, right, and recovers, and then we will have to look at that. So I would not let that 
deter me now because if we don't do what's needed now we're going to have much bigger problems in the future right we have to make sure that we're not going to have lasting damage to the economy now right take all the actions we can to avoid that and then we can deal with right the put the fiscal policy back on a more sustainable path regarding the fed's balance sheet i think if you look right as the economy grows right our the the you know our balance sheet becomes a smaller percent of of gdp so we have we have room on our balance sheet to use it so just continuing a little bit on a negative path uh if <laughs> If you think if more stay-at-home orders were uh, popped up again, and it's hard to understand what the data means right now uh, around COVID and testing, but do you think there's a possibility if we have to really go back inside in a big way and pull back that we could enter a depression? Well, I mean, I think that'll make things, you know, we'll go backwards instead of forwards. We've seen some pretty nice couple of reports here that things are picking back up. So of course, you know, if things go, we can all write down bad scenarios, right? It's harder to come up with good scenarios, but I think if we invested in testing and contact tracing and, you know, got to a treatment that seemed to be working and also, you know, could develop the vaccine, there's positive outcomes too that could happen. So sure, you know, if, if you, can, you could write, I could write down and I'm sure everyone can write down a really dire situation, right? And, and sure, we'll see that again, right? I think the, 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 the hard part is like coming up with something that's reasonable and then we just have to keep monitoring, monitoring as things go by and things happen and make sure that we're doing all we can to control, right, the spread of the virus, doing all we can to make it um, safe environments for us to all re-engage in the economy, right, and then kind of develop the science, right, and the medical treatments that are needed, right, to get over this. So, you know, I, I know, Dan, you want to be negative, but there are some, you know, we can be positive too if we take the right steps. You know, as you know, I, I've said I'm trying to be neither optimistic nor pessimistic, but realistic, so I have multiple scenarios as well. <laughs> um, but going to, from the particular to the more theoretical, taking you back to your, more of your academic uh, bent, uh, Ray, Ray Hugel is asking, um, what effect do you see this economic decline in having on the perception of the so-called modern monetary policy? <laughs> okay. I mean, I, there are going to be relationships that are going to be drawn here. Okay. So one thing is, you know, we're in a situation where both the, the fiscal authorities and the Fed have been working together, right? Think about the emergency lending facilities, right? To actually, you know, make sure that, there is liquidity, right, available and cash flowing to households and businesses um, of all sizes, right? And so you could argue that that's an example of, you know, the coming together, the fiscal authorities and the Fed. But remember, that's an emergency lending facility. And, you know, I think what you're seeing, though, is the nature of this economic shock calls for both the fiscal side and the monetary policy side to take the actions that it can take, right, to make sure that we don't have lasting damage, right, to the underlying economy and that we actually help people span this, this situation. And so what looks like sort of, oh, we can coordinate all this together is just the natural both sides coming together, realizing how deep a shock this has been and that there are appropriate things that both parties should be doing and some of that means working together, like the emergency lending facilities. And I want to come back down again um, and talk a little bit more about you. So uh, you're, you run the Cleveland Fed. You talked about uh, the catchment area that, that that bank has. Can you talk a little bit about what you see uh, as a person who is there looking out um, around their, their district? Uh, in terms of how the economy is doing, what unemployment, a little bit of the micro look from your district's perspective, right. businesses, how they're thinking right. about things. I know you're quite connected in that community. Right. So I had sort of the honor of being on the governor's economic advisory board, nonpartisan. It had, you know, firms from all different sectors, um, part of it. So that actually was very useful um, in sort of hearing 
directly from companies that were having to deal with some of the challenges that the situation put, put them all in. And then again, right, we get economic reconnaissance from our uh, business advisory councils. We have them all across um, our district and we have direct ties to community development because we have a, a, a community advisory council as well. So, right, that information is really telling us that, as you said in your opening remarks, the minority and low income areas have been very hard hit by this, extremely hard hit. I mean, the disparity is, is kind of sh striking. And they all say to a one that, you know, they were really, before this hit, they were actually seeing change in a positive direction. And then now with this, they, they were first very fearful that this is going to unwind all the positive that's happened. It took 10 years, but it started to happen and take them back, back to where they were. And they all think for, for one, that it's just gonna take a lot to get out of the situation they're in. On the other hand, you see some firms that are saying that since the Ohio started opening up and allowing businesses to re-engage, that activity has actually come back faster than they thought it was going to. So for example, you know, there are, um, we have some uh, contacts in uh, the restaurant business. Now, they have a large component of this business that's takeout, but nonetheless, right, they're back up to 75% capacity and, and they say that's what they need to be sustainable. So that's a positive. Um, on the negative side, some firms said, we didn't really think that we'd have to lay off workers and we ended up having to do it. And now bringing, back, bringing them back on is going slower than they thought. So again, it's mixed, but I would say that everyone sort of readjusted their expectations. And so now they're seeing some positives, but that's because they lowered their expectations as the thing went on. It became clearer that this was a significant um, economic uh, negative event. And so some of it is, you know, okay, we think things are coming back maybe a little faster than we thought, but that's because they had already revised down what they thought. And most of them say to get back to where they were before, it's just gonna take time. It's gonna take quite a long time. They think it's gonna recover. So they're all basically saying things will recover. It's just gonna take time. Well, thanks you. I have, my heart is in Cleveland uh, as a, as a one-time dentist in there. Um, final question and also just sticking to the a little bit more on the micro Loretta's universe uh, theme. Uh, you've been a fantastic member of our board. Um, is there anything that you would like to talk about in terms of um, why, why you took on that role, the importance, the meaning it has for you and our audience or high, our, our educators and students, uh, is there a message you'd like to give to high school students who might have tuned in today with their educators? And then I'll uh, make a couple of very brief closing remarks because we want to end on time. Right. I mean, in some sense, the work you're doing, man, sells itself. Because if you ever needed to have a reason that you need to understand the economy um, and finance and personal finance, this is the time. Because these challenges are, are heavy. These are very heavy challenges that everyone is going through. And the work you're doing to make sure that, right, even the youngest, right, a K, K, right, you start very young, I think that's really important. And the work that you're doing, the Cleveland Fed has programs as well. Um, you know, we've done the same thing you have. We've had to convert our programs to be virtual. Um, but again, I think it's very important for people to get facility with some of the concepts um, because it makes their lives better if they can make informed decisions about their own financial system, if they understand how the economy works, if they understand, you know, uh, the job market. All these things are really beneficial. So I think that we can do a lot of good um, by educating everyone. And I, you know, I'm really, I'm grateful that I'm on your board um, because I really do believe in the work. Um, and I, the Fed has, you know, an economic education uh, mission as well. Um, you could even say, I know we don't say this, but, you know, you could say that part of our job in monetary policy is economic education because we're learning, right? We learn from everyone who talks to us. Um, so we're learning and we're also trying to communicate what we're doing. So to my mind, right, 
this is a, a, a it's you have to learn. And I, the other thing I want to credit you for is the work you're doing on documenting, right? That knowing about economics and knowing about finance actually does improve somebody's economic and financial well being. And I think that work um, is significant. It's not just talking like, oh, isn't it great to know economics? You actually can show and demonstrate that students who learn economics and finance um, in, in grade school and in high school actually perform better and, and end up in a better spot, so. Well, well, thank you. We are, um, it should be obvious from your, your just remarks now that we are very fortunate to, to have you and to be able to partner with the Federal Reserve on a number of initiatives. And we're still looking forward to having the personal finance challenge in Cleveland next year in yeah. person, hopefully for all of our yeah. sakes. Uh, it's so much more fun. And um, in terms of our mission and dem demonstrable results, we are uh, doubling down in all of our programs this year to make sure that we're creating access to the kids that need it the most. Because um, it's great if, if, if everybody has it, it's nice when some kids have it, but we need to make uh, even a, a, a more deliberate attempt to be in communities where teachers need more access to our resources uh, our webinars, our tools, uh, being virtual has helped us a lot. Um, I hope you can all tell that I'm very passionate about this and I, I need to take a moment to remind everybody that uh, this is a time when not-for-profits such as CE really need your help. Uh, unrestricted giving really lets us do the things that we've been, been doing. We, we turned on a dime in the last uh, several months and in the last several weeks to try to meet educators where they are with what, what they need. Our mission is enduring, um, equipping kids and their families with the tools and knowledge to build better and more resilient lives. So when you get your thank you note for attending, there'll be a donate button there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Loretta and the team who helped us to make this possible today.